Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at Noon starts now. Topic our news here at noon. We are watching the weather for you this afternoon. There's a chance for a few flakes to mix in with the rain this afternoon. I feel like that's the worst combination that you can have. The flakes and the rain? Yeah. We don't want that, but you're going to need to grab your coat, grab your umbrella before you head out of the house over the next couple of hours. In fact, Here's a, a live look for you at a very depressing, sad and gloomy downtown Detroit. It's a beautiful downtown Detroit, but, but it is a little gloomy, gloomy today. <laughs> but I know that what's getting me through these colder temperatures is the we are on the up and up and Brandon's been teasing all yes. week for me that my kind of temperatures are coming back. Coming so, back. Brandon, what can we expect as far as today goes? Struggling though? temperature wise, guys, I think the cool and the wind may be a bigger issue than the rain and the snow. Right now we've got 37 in Pontiac, 38 Mount Clemens, 41 Ann Arbor, 43 Monroe, 42 degrees as we look in uh, at Metro for our official number. So again, struggling with these upper 30s, low 40s, the winds are really whipping out there. These are gusts, occasional bursts. It's 10 to 20 on the wind speed, gusting 30 plus at times, jostling those Halloween decorations around a bit, and it feels like the 20s to lower 30s. We do have some rain showers on the lighter side here, but they are moving sort of north to south here at a decent clip, moving at about uh, 25 to 30 miles an hour, heading into Franklin, Clawson, Frazier, Huntington Woods shortly, and we have a little snow right behind that. So some wintry mix and rain eventually becoming plain rain, but only middle 40s with those gusty winds and that wet weather likely to slow you down running errands and in the evening commute as well. And we're not done yet, guys. All right, thank you, Brandon. And the mid-Michigan man accused of killing and mutilating a man he met on a dating app is back in a courtroom today. Yeah, it's a hearing to decide what charge Mark Latunsky is going to be facing after a plea deal. Local 4 Sean Lay has been following the developments for us. He joins us now live this afternoon. Sean? First thing I want to do is show everyone the people we're talking about here. Here's pictures this is Mark David Latunsky. He has the beard on the other side. There is the victim, young Kevin Bacon, just 25 years old when his life was taken from him. Here's what's happening in court as we speak right now. We'll take you inside a Shiawassee courtroom at this noon hour. The defendant, Mark David Latunsky, the crime unthinkable. Latunsky pled guilty to killing and dismembering 25 year old Kevin Bacon. Bacon was a college student. The two meeting on the dating app Grinder. The horrific homicide with elements of cannibalism taking place in December of 2019. By pleading guilty to open murder, the issue today, if Latunsky is now convicted of first degree, second degree murder, or manslaughter, witnesses are being called one after another today, going over the horrible evidence in this case. That win Brandon was talking about as we're going live here. But the bottom line, we're still waiting for a decision from the judge. We'll have everything wrapped up for you. A lot of testimony today. We're going to boil it all down at 5 o'clock. Back to you guys. A very disturbing case nonetheless, uh, but Sean, we know you'll stay on top of it. Very Thank good. you. All right, so we are learning more about how the plan to ease student loan debt is going to work. The Biden administration just rolled out a website for people to apply for $10,000 in relief. We've got our Nick Monticelli. Uh, he's, got, he's here with more on how to take advantage and the debate over who will pay. Good afternoon. We are talking about 8 million Americans that have already signed up for this program and 40 million Americans that would be eligible. There are a lot of questions right now, though. Number one, could this raise inflation? Number two, how is it going to be paid for? Morgan Downing, a master's student at Harvard, could be weeks away from watching her student debt shrink. Before the uh, $10,000 of forgiveness, I was looking at $26,000. However, I do know that I have another loan, about $20,000 um, from grad school. But now, for the first time, Morgan and millions of other Americans can log on to studentaid.gov and apply for debt relief. The fact that I just submit and got a confirmation of like 10 minutes later, um, it was just really exciting. So who can apply? Individuals who in the past two years made less than $125,000 and families that earn less than 250000 
Debt cancellation can be as much as $10,000 per applicant or as much as $20,000 for Pell Grant recipients. But could that extra spending power increase inflation? Some Democrats say no. There have been a lot of studies around this, and what they've shown is that it's not going to have an impact on inflation. However, the nonpartisan committee for a responsible federal budget says yes. It estimates Biden's student debt policies altogether could boost inflation between a sixth and a quarter point over the next year. Republicans also argue for student loan relief, taxpayers foot the bill. It's very unfair you know, to have a truck driver have to pay back a loan from somebody that got like a PhD in gender studies. There are some lawsuits against the president's student debt relief program, so this all could get halted. We'll have to see what happens in court. Also, for those who have applied, the government is saying it will be weeks until they even start looking at those applications. I'm Nick Monticelli, Local 4. Nick, thank you. Right now we want to get to breaking news that we're following for you this afternoon. The Justice Department is charging a French company with paying millions of dollars to ISIS. Federal prosecutors say the company, the cement company Lafarge, paid the terrorist organization so its plan in Syria could stay open. The Justice Department says it happened at a time when ISIS was actively plotting to harm Americans. The company has pleaded guilty to this and has agreed to penalties totaling nearly $800 million. All right, so we are exactly three weeks away from Election Day. It is the final sprint for candidates as they are preparing, the people are preparing to head to the polls to decide Michigan's next governor and who gets control of Congress. Bree Jackson is in Washington with a look at some of the crucial races across the country, and there is plenty of political drama. Attacks were flying last night as candidates in tight state and federal races faced off on the debate stage, sparring over key issues like inflation and abortion. With early voting underway in states like Georgia, the gloves are off as opponents take political and personal jabs. We are the ones that have been fighting for you when Ms. Abrams was not. We were giving tax refunds. We need a governor who actually believes in equity, racial equity, Thank economic you. equity in the state of Georgia. Georgia is one of several battleground states with tight U.S. Senate races. In Ohio, candidates clashed over hot-button issues ranging from racist rhetoric to immigration. You cannot pretend to be a defender of border security when you have voted against border wall funding multiple times. I disagree with President Biden when he's talking about relax, uh, relaxing some of the regulations down on the border. Midterms are often seen as a referendum on the party in power. Some Republican candidates are using that to their advantage, blaming President Biden and Democrats for the higher prices Americans face, from the gas pump to groceries. There's only one cause of inflation. It's excessive spending by Congress. I know that the only time we've ever gotten our fiscal house in order is when Republicans and Democrats have worked together. Senator Lee refuses to do that. Nationwide, a woman's right to choose is on the ballot. Iowa's governor's race illustrating that divide. I signed the heartbeat bill with exceptions. It got enjoined uh, with the ruling on Roe v. Wade. Now the, the fight is in the state's hands, and so we have to defend it right here in the state. The fight for control of state legislatures and Congress Congress is at stake, with polls showing the economy is what's top of mind for voters. President Biden returns to the campaign trail on Thursday. That's when he'll travel to Pennsylvania to show support for U.S. Senate candidate John Fetterman. He's locked in a tight race with Republican and celebrity Dr. Mehmet Oz. In Washington, I'm Bree Jackson for NBC News. We thank you. Early voting and absentee voting is already underway here in Michigan. And right now on ClickOnDetroit.com, we've got a breakdown of all the races for you, all the ballot proposals and key deadlines as well. Our voter guide is up right now on the elections page. Well, nonprofits in the city of Detroit getting a big boost of funding thanks to the Gilbert family. Today, the Gilbert Family Foundation and Strategic Community Partners announced the Thriving Neighborhoods Fund. Now, this is a $500,000 investment into nonprofits right here in the city. 20 organizations will be receiving educational resources along with a grant of $25,000 to deepen their work right here in Detroit.
These really are the unsung heroes and sheroes of our communities that, as you mentioned, work diligently and tirelessly to create thriving neighborhoods. And so we appreciate your work. And I just know that today is a great day as we are giving you all the resources that you need to bring forward more visions and, and projects within your respective communities. Super exciting news and the Gilbert Family Foundation says that the goal of this initiative is to amplify the incredible work their organizations do for this community by creating more opportunities for community members. We've got some some really sad news this afternoon. The matriarch of a Christmas empire in Frankenmuth has died. Yes, Irene Bronner was one of the founding members of Bronner's, the world's largest Christmas store. If you've ever been there, you know just how magical this place is. Her husband, Wally Bronner, started a sign painting business back in 1945, and six years later, it turned into a Christmas store. Irene and Wally passed on ownership to their children, but helped run it until Wally died back in 2008. Irene Bronner died Sunday at the age of 95.